the stuff is there that it, so if I want to talk about it, it's there now. So, <clears throat> uh, oh, oh one, one more thing I wanted to mention before we started recording, but I, I seem to have a screw in my tire on my car. So I'm going to have to go fix that today. So that one more thing in my, my list of things. <clears throat> now that's safe for posterity. Uh, let's the, um, I'm still trying to get the IMU to publish a ROS message. I tried to use ROS serial to do that. And I ran into a situation where ROS serial was not compiling correctly. In the process of debugging that, I started to get error messages with uh, CMake being an older version. And as a reminder, I was doing this on a machine. Previously, I was using Platform IO to do all my compile via the things directly connected to my RPI on the robot, doing it all remotely. So those versions got to a point where they were I couldn't upgrade them any longer, so I started directly connecting to um, um, what I'll call my control laptop. Um, and so then I had CMake problems, and I'm like, okay, sh to heck with this. I'm going to upgrade my um, uh, control laptop. And so what I've been up working on, painfully so, well, it's not been that terribly bad. Um, just trying to share, because I wrote instructions as so, well, more or less notes as I was going through this. Um, I mean, so now for Programming my um, microcontrollers that'll connect via USB to the RPI. I have to do that off the RPI and then take them in and plug them in. Um, I'm going to do that on an Ubuntu 20 machine running ROS Noetic. And um, so I have to go through the process of getting 20 on and then installing ROS. And creating the cat, new Catkin workspace. I just started all that from scratch. Um, put the tutorials on there just to make sure everything was loaded correctly. Put the Arduino IDE on the machine, made sure I could get Blink to work, then installed raw serial, and then compiled and ran a hello world. Um, to get a message coming from the microcontroller via ROS back to my um, Noetic machine. Yeah, that all looks simple when you've got it all written down and the instructions are there, but <laughs> it, it was, uh, took longer than, than what I had wanted. Um, so also keep in mind, if you go to uh, Ubuntu 20 and Noetic, everything is now in Python 3. Whereas everything in 1604 and uh, Kinetic, that was all in Python 2.7. So, so it, it's not a clean jump from one to the other, but typically you can make things work if you put enough effort into it. I Well, I noticed a reference to Python 3 and in previous um, things that I had written down 
you know, I'd actually gone through the process of installing three. So for the time being, I'm not going to install two seven. And see, it'll be interesting to see when that first blows up and causes a problem. Um, but again, the laptop that I'm really talking about is really um, what I'll call the operator laptop and now used to compile the microcontrollers off, you know, um, I don't know what the right word is, but to compile, to compile them off the, off the robot and then take them to the robot. Um, so we'll see how what sort of challenges this causes me. The other thing I'll mention is um, I happen to be in Texas and I don't know, I came across an old document that referenced cores data in Texas. And I said, well, I'll just check. And, um, you know, the local, the closest station is this TXHE station. And if you check who owns it, it's owned by the Texas Department of Transportation. If you check their website, this seemed to be new. This data is available for the purposes of post-processing differential corrections. I mean, and if you go and actually um, pull up that data, you'll see that the most recent is a couple of weeks old. And I don't know about all that post-processing stuff. You probably understand it. I just thought it was interesting that they're at least providing some information to, to the public um, from, from that station. So I guess if I wanted to validate you know, the position that I create here, I guess I could figure out all that post-processing stuff and Go try to validate that position. Yeah, if you want to do post processing, if you pull up the RTK Lib software, and then as long as you saved a log of all your data while you're driving around, then you start up the, their post processing routine and you load in, you, you point to your data and you point to this data, this correction data here, and then it will, after the fact, give you you know, the, the actual path that you're driving. So that, that may be good in the future to, uh, to, to verify one against the other to see how well, you know, everything's, everything's working. But I, I, from, from day one, when I was looking up uh, the corrections data, it said, yes, Texas has free, or it has all the real-time correction data, but they're, we're not gonna give it to you. You have to be a, an employee of the state, and then you can get it for free. But if you're not, you're screwed because we're Texas. They, they didn't take the extension say, because we are Republicans. They just said, we are not going to give it to you because we don't want to. So yeah, that's, but they will give you the, the post-processing stuff. You can pull that up later and, and verify stuff. It referenced by state statute, it would be interesting to find out who, which, um, which state senators supported that. Say, hey, come on guys, go the next step, give us access. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is in the process of, you can see my screen, right? I'm still sharing. Yes, I can. Um, in the process of cleaning up my files and, you know, before I, installed 20, um, I was getting my files organized and I realized I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different um, Rossi books. So if, um, I mean, I'm sure you probably have your own collection, but if, if you ever want um, any of those, I've got those. A couple of them are written by Joseph or Linton Joseph. Um, 
Linton and Jefferson's, which I found particularly uh, interesting and useful. And these, where I've got a folder, you know, as with a lot of books these days, you get, um, you know, example code. Um, come on, open up. You get example projects. What was interesting, I think it was this one, chapter nine. This chef bot. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to find it quickly, but um, it was using move base and so there was a routine in there about sending in messages, you know, goal messages and um, it also the way it was originally written, I don't know if it still is, but um, they were just taking straight string commands from their microcontroller and um, translating those, getting them first as a string command and then translating them as opposed to you know, publishing it directly from their microcontroller, for example, his IMU data he was getting from off of, um, you know, a USB port serial connection as opposed to uh, making the, making a Ross, a Ross topic, which I just thought was interesting. Anyway, so that's there. If, um, if any of those, I mean, you could spend forever going through those, but sometimes they're good examples. That's what's going on in my world. So I don't remember a whole lot about what I was doing this week, but uh, one of the things, I keep looking at Adafruit to see when they're gonna put their IMUs back in stock and they give absolutely no indication of if and when they're ever gonna put that board out again. I know it's on SparkFun, they've got one that's, it's $15 more, but they, they put out a note says, oh, in a few days, we're gonna put 150 or so in stock. And they and I, so I signed up for notification, they sent me the notification. And when I went and looked, it said no, nothing there. I thought, oh, they're sold out already. But then I looked the next day and they, there are a bunch of them on there. So. So I've got the option if I want to go with the newer IMU, I could go to SparkFun right now and spend $35 and hopefully not more than $5 shipping and get that one. Or I could wait for Adafruit and I don't know if they're ever going to put that out. And if they do, they may raise the price too. Uh, you know, so oh, we got them back in stock and now the price is higher. But so I don't know what's going to go there. But I figure out since I'm still screwing around with this older one, I've got plenty, plenty to play with before I get too carried away. But I still have the situation that if I take the the older one, the BNO 55, and I put that LED on so I can tell what the calibration state is. If I start before I start moving, I pick the robot up and move it around and spin it around until that says yeah, it, yeah, it's fully calibrated now. So I put the thing back on the ground. But then when I start driving, it starts dropping in the calibration value. So it's it's got that background automatic calibration that's always going on. And I noticed on yours both in the data sheet and a little snippet of code that I cut out of your stuff and posted to Slack and said, this is how you turn off background calibra calibration. So once you get it calibrated and uh, I, I, on yours, I'm not sure you have to reload the values in every time you run it or not, but on, on mine, if you say start it up from scratch in the morning, you have to load the values, the calibration values into it and then it will be quote fully calibrated. But if you start moving, it's gonna, the calibration will change on you. So there's no way to change that. So I'm thinking the newer one that you have, you can, it, you can you turn that option off so you could load the values in and it will be fully calibrated, you know, from, from what you decided before. So you run your calibration routine and calibrate it like you were doing. And then if you turn off that background calibration, it'll prevent it from, for, from the calibration dropping back out. So that's, that's a good thing. And, but I thought, well, since I've got that older one, I'll still continue playing with that. So you know, there's only one data point, in, but driving from here to, or uh, from Pennsylvania to Texas, uh, and 
um, firing the IMU up here, it appears to not need calibration again. Um, I mean, again, well, one data point inside, not, I mean, I, I don't know how noisy would consider an inside environment sitting next to a laptop to be, but um, it seems to be um, pretty, pretty, pretty close to accurate. Well, the calibration you're doing is not for your location. It's based on uh, your your IMU next to whatever you're you're on. So once you bolt it on your vehicle, you're cal calibrating it to your vehicle. And if right now you're just doing it, say on your desk or whatever, as long as you don't have anything around, then it, the calibration shouldn't shouldn't matter too much. If you don't have anything that's disturbing the magnetic field, then it shouldn't be shouldn't be a problem. But but technically, it's for once you bolt it onto the vehicle, then it's it's saying, oh, I see an engine up here and I see a battery back here or whatever, and it takes all of it into account. And then as long as you don't move the IMU on the vehicle or lay a say a lay a, a pipe wrench next to your IMU. You should be okay so that and that, that happened once at, at Danfoss it wasn't a pipe wrench it was just a big piece of metal like a big like 10 pound piece of angle iron that somebody had and they thought oh I'll just stick it in here they put it on the floor in the tractor and the, the IMU was bolted to the bottom of the seat so it was about six inches away and everything was all screwed up and they found out oh somebody had conveniently left as a big piece of steel here right next to our IMU and that will screw it up if, if that happens. And in fact, some people claim that even on a, a tractor, if, if you got an IMU and you calibrate it and then you hook onto a planter or a, a plow behind you, that that's enough magnetic disturbance that'll screw up your IMU and you have to drive around calibrated again. So I, I have no idea if that's true or not. That The guy from Novotel was telling us that because he was saying, oh, that's why we don't use magnetic on our, our, on our GPS stuff because, because of that. I, I didn't know if that was true or not. But that's what he told us. <clears throat> So let's see. So you, the Spark Fund inventory is available. Is what I'm. Is that what you concluded? They they did have stuff available now. They as of yesterday they did. I didn't. I haven't checked it today. But it's the B and O eighty, not the eighty five. And the, the Adafruit website says, oh, it's just because the eighty five they fixed uh, something about the SPI interface, is why they went to eighty five from an eighty. But you go look at the data sheet and it says, well, the 85 has some kind of user loadable algorithms or something. And they mentioned VR, AR, which I assume AR is, or VR is virtual reality. I guess AR is assisted reality. So that thing with the, the headset they're showing, apparently that's that stuff you get with the BNO 85 as opposed to the 80. And I, so I don't, I don't know who to believe anymore. I, I read all this different stuff and there's so so looking at three different chips trying to figure out what's going on i i don't know too much about any any particular one but the spark fund one i i, I think it is, it is in stock but it's a bno 80 and it's 15 dollars more than what adafruit wants well you gotta hope that if um, spark fund was able to get some chips then adafruit would be able to get some chips too Except the Adafruit's going with the 85 as opposed to the 80, so it could be that one's for some reason harder to get. I don't know. It just annoys me. They won't say we are expecting them in, in a month or five years or anything. So, but anyway, I'm still playing with my old ones. So I don't really care too much on that. <clears throat> and I was going to show you a plot of my uh, the the calibration being calibrated and dropping off. Oh, let's yeah, see, maybe it's on my. I was going to show it to you on the screen, but the the plot I have open right now doesn't have it. Let me go back and check my uh, pictures and see if I, I I save a bunch of screen dumps, so I might have something here. I'll I'll tell you in a second here. I see I got about five thousand pictures in my directory here, so. I think I just pull them up and scroll through them while, while we're online here. But I thought, well, I better not. Because the first one I pulled up was a sen sensory link. Something I was complaining about. So we back up here. And get close. 
Well, this one, this one doesn't look real good. Let me, let me share this one. Share screen, select window. And again, depending which uh, screenshot, let's see if this shows up. As you've started thinking. Okay, there we go. So this is the, uh, on this plot here, I seem to have, why do I have three things plotted? Uh, it doesn't matter. Oh, the bottom, the bottom line where it says zero down there. Let me move my pictures out, my people out of the way. It says that is, uh, yeah, I can't read it. Something about GPS one, pause heading. So actually, I think that's the uh, the moving, no. The, the line at the bottom says zero. Apparently, my GPS wasn't working that day, so I got nothing for the heading. So that, that's what that yellow line at the bottom is down there. Actually, I can show you down, your, down here. That's your RGC point. Dual. Yeah, and that's the one that's supposed to give me the moving baseline, the static heading, and for some reason that day, I think that's one my it, it was giving me the ASIO error, and it wasn't running, so that was... So for, I didn't get any data from that that day. But the red line there is the, uh, again, the the red line here is the the heading off the IMU. And then over here, which is here, I can turn that off. I'm like, oh, that's a picture. I can't turn it off. But, it, but the green, starting over here, starting here, the, the green line is zero coming across. And then I pick the thing up, and it jumps up to a calibration of one. And then I, I, I picked it up, started spinning around. I got a calibration of two. And then before I was done, it dropped back to a, it dropped all the way back to zero again. And there, it never, never came back again. So once it gets the calibration, it, it tends to drop off. And that can be a problem. So, and I don't know if, if I'm, if I'm drunk. What's that? That's the quality indicator. Yes, that's the one that says the the quality of the calibration. I'm not sure what that means, but it they say three is the best, so it never got up here to the top. I've multiplied everything by hundred just so I can see it, but it should have come all the way up to here. And I've got some previous ones. Let's see if I can stop sharing here. And then go look at my pictures. Maybe I can find a better one here to look at. And I may I may have posted a picture to Slack too, but okay, here we're getting close. Let me back up one more here. Okay, this one here. Uh, so we said can say what a pain. Okay, come here, share screen, big screen. Okay, when this comes up here, <clears throat> so on this one, that's kind of a fuzzy image. I'm not sure why that looks so bad, but it, it just does, I guess. Looks and if I'd here. say, well, I, I, the, I've got the two side by side, and the, 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 one, the one looks terrible, and it could be because I said, sure, the, the window as opposed to the screen. Let me try, let me try this. Say so stop share. And say share the screen, and then allow. Now say entire screen. Don't put any secrets on here. And then go to pictures, pictures. I make this bigger. And it still looks the same. Anyway, so this was a situation where. Now my cursor doesn't move. <laughs> uh, sorry for wasting all this time, but I'm no big deal. on a different computer. It, it doesn't seem to be working quite right. So we'll go back and do this one. Well, that's kind of moving. Anyway, right, okay. It's just moving real slow. 
so on the left is the the image of where I was driving around the driving around the yard and I just started I basically just started here drove in a couple circles and then drove forward and backwards a couple times and I just drove out on the sidewalk and drove north and turned around came south and turned around so before I did that on the on the right here this red line shows the calibration status of the IMU the magnetic calibration so I started off at zero and then I came over here I picked it up and started moving the lifted the front end up and down lifted up put it down moved it around in a circle until it finally got up here to what it says calibration of three and then it only took like you know 60 seconds or so to do all that so I thought okay I'm all set so I put it on the ground and started driving as I started driving around then all of a sudden it dropped back to a calibration status of two and I drove around some more and it dropped down to calibration status of one which my, my cursor's lagging way behind here and then it, it, it so it just kind of moved up and down the whole time I was driving around and I think on yours you can turn that off so once you get it in the calibrated state status you say don't keep monkeying with it the whole time you're driving around but the one I've got right now it's it's just apparently going to do that to me and I, I I don't know if as soon as it drops if can I get my cursor to move? See, like right there, as soon as I drop from a three to a two, I don't know if I can just slam the calibration data back in and continue on. Somewhere it actually says, I think right in the BNO55 documentation, it says uh, the, the background calibration may turn on and it will it will screw up your your data you're doing. And somebody was talking about this and saying that they can find absolutely no way on the BNO55 to turn that off. But uh, it looks like on the newer one that you've got, where somebody took the, the code and made it better, they've actually fixed that. So you can just say, once you get the calibration data loaded in, turn off the background calibration. But you can find, once you get that far, you can find out if it's going to be a problem and see how it acts. And I can't experiment right now because I don't have one of those boards. So I, I don't know how that's going to act. But anyway, that's, that's something I was playing around with, trying to get that to work. And uh, anything else? And th this is just where I was plotting a lot of data. Where the top one is the. Uh, are you doing this real time, or are you doing this with like a bag file later? The, these are all bag files. Everything I'm showing here, and this is Plot Juggler. And Plot Juggler, you just say open open a bag file, and then all the stuff on the over here on the left. You know, you get this whole list of whatever topics you have. There's the topic. You pull it down. Now there's all the subtopics, and you can plot anything. Anything you want, and the nice thing is, let me go back to a, a live, a live plot juggler. <clears throat> and for, uh, it's it's lagging here. Okay, so so like on here, for instance, on the left is the uh, this is the GPS plot as I drove around the block. And I finally, I finally did something I haven't done before. I drove around in the re reverse direction. Normally I'd always go, I would start, start here in my front yard and then go north. And then I was always making, I was always going counterclockwise. So I was always making left-hand turns. But this time I thought, well, gee, I should go the other direction just to see what it does. So I started here and drove out on the sidewalk and drove south. And then went around and so I went in a clockwise direction. So I'm making right hand turns. And the nice thing about plot juggler, you come down here to the bottom, you grab this slider, and you can move this, and it, it locks all your plots together so you can see in real time where you are on your ground plot and all of your other, you know, linear plots. You can see exactly where you are and what, what things they're doing there. And the, the reason I wanted to pull this up was before you I leave that. A lot. What's that? I was going to say before you leave that, what was the top right uh, flags? Well, that's something we're going to get to. That is, uh, uh, here, hold on just a second. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. No, 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 no. Okay, so we go to this plot. Uh, I found out that I wanted to know if I was in it, what, what my state was in. Is it in? Uh, a single point fix or a, a float fix or a RTK, a full RTK fix. Right. And it turns out that the GPS slash fix topic that puts out only puts out a zero or a two. And on, on, so the top plot is the output of the, uh, that, that fix status. And if it's a two, it, after, after a couple of days of digging, it turns, if it's a two, that's an RTK fix. 
if you don't have an RDK fix, it puts out a zero. There's no in between. And at zero, you don't even know if that's a single point fix or nothing at all. And that kind of annoyed me. So I was trying, I was digging through the drivers, trying to figure out how to how to find out what's actually coming out. And I, I couldn't decide if it was a problem with the uh, the U blocks uh, receiver itself wasn't putting out the data, or if it was the driver wasn't wasn't converting it correctly. So I went back and looked at the NEMA Navsat driver, and it basically works the same way. It takes in something from your NEMA and then puts out. I think yours will also only put out a zero or a two running the NEMA Navsat driver. At, at one point, Matt said he fixed it and made it do something. To show a float status, but when I looked at it, it wasn't changing this number. It was just changing something like the uh, uh, what do you call that? The um, the covariance. It was affecting the covariance if you had a float. Mm -hmm. So when I dug through mine, I found out digging through all the messages, I had to actually go out and put a uh, I put my Windows laptop on it and ran the U Connect software, the U Connect U U Center, the U Center software, and it knows exactly what state you're in. I thought, well, how are they doing that? So after much digging, I was watching the different screens and it turns out here, down here, I'm printing out something called flags and flags is like an eight bit number with each bit position tells you something. Well, in this one, it turns out if you are at um, the, the bit or the flag for RTK fix is 128. So this line across there, which says 131, cause it's got some other flags added to it. But this, anytime it's at this point, along here this is i'm in an rtk fix and then if it drops to a float it comes down to a 64. so so there's when i first started out it was in a float float situation here and kind of out in the middle of that the plot it dropped to a float here and over here it dropped to a float and it got so bad it dropped down to all the way down here i think it drops down to a single point fix so i know those three different conditions i'm not sure what to do with that information other than uh knowing what's going on and i don't think I have, yeah, let's go back to the first one we had, the one you were asking about. So at this point, if we go back and start at the beginning, so I'm sitting in the front yard and uh, I'm sitting there, it's already in a float uh, situation. If you look up here, you can see it's sitting in a float level and just short, a short time later, all of a sudden, come on. So right, right there, when it when it jumped to a fix up here, the 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 line on the plot, which I don't think I actually moved the vehicle. I think the thing just simply went from a float to a fix, and it jumped to that point. So that's the starting point right there. So now as I move this forward, you can see the thing will come around. I, as I said, I was doing clockwise this time, so you can see it's going down, down to the bottom. It's driving across. It'll come all the way around here, and I get right about there, and it drops to a to a float. And it turns out there's a big tree right about, uh, I think it's in the yard over here. It's it's just a monster tree that every time the wind blows, I think it's going to fall over on somebody's house. It's like a 50 foot tall tree that's out there. And it's, I don't know if it's a, like a willow or something. It's um, the one that gets those fuzzy little things on it for seeds. <laughs> anyway, one of those kind of trees. So anyway, so, so right in there, it dropped out. And as, as I start driving forward here, it, and then it comes back again. Everybody's happy. It's driving along with a fix. And right there, I, it stopped. And I think that's where I was having problems with my uh, remote control. Just simply was ignoring me for whatever. So I'll start moving the slider again. And it moves forward. And it stopped again. And then it, it was wiggling a little bit there. Okay, now it's driving again. So when I get to right here, it drops to a float again. And there's a, I think there's a big tree right here. And there's a big tree right here. So you're, you're asking about what does it do when you get close to the trees? Well, that's apparently what it does. It drops to a, a float uh, situation, but you can see that you can see the position here. You can see the line is still doing a pretty good job of, uh, you know, it still looks, you, you can't see that it's way off. It's position is driving around. So again, as I say, I don't know what to do. If I get an indication, say a drop from fixed to a float, what to do about that. But it looks like it's, it's still maintaining a pretty decent uh, path here. <clears throat> Oh, that that beeping that's going on in the background. We don't have somebody else trying to trying to get in. D does it require authorization to get into this, or does it? Like, we don't want somebody sitting there waiting to get in. I don't hear any beeping, but I'll check. Now uh, maybe maybe that's my computer that's doing that. Since I got two computers running here, I I don't know which one is making noises. I don't see any uh, notices. Okay. 
so anyways i drove around here so i get up get up to the corner here and once i get around the corner it jumps back to a fix and stays in a fixed solution all the way back around until i come back and park in the front yard so so that gives me another way to look at it and to, to know you know if, if it's doing something stupid i can look at it and say well what is it actually doing but here let me let me back up again back to this area here so it was in a float and while i was sitting there and then for some reason it got bad enough it dropped out to a single point fixed and again i don't see the uh the the gps doing any big jumps here or anything one of the plots i have it did oh oh right here can i can i zoom in on this So if I up at the corner up there and if I back off, even though I changed the zoom on, see that this thing still tracks as I move here. Let's see how to get that to work. There it is. So see all three plots is tracking that that position as I drive around there. As I come around, see it's in a float uh, right now. As I get closer up here, and then all of a sudden, bang, it just dropped to a to a fix. And it, it did jump, and if that's why I pulled up this plot down here, because this the blue one is in latitude and longitude, which doesn't really mean anything to me. And the green one down here is in meters after it's been connected, so or corrected. So if I come down here and look at it. And so it jumps from around 94 to maybe 95 meters. And, and actually it's, I think if I zoom in even more, that's not really quite that bad. So it goes a little over like 94.1 to 94 point, what is it, eight or so. So that's how far it jumped when it's changed from a float to a fix. So that, so that, recording so that what's that? About three quarters of a meter, maybe. Yeah, something like that. So that, again, that just an indicate, you know, go back and look at the data. I can see what it was doing. And I see just by looking at the, uh, you know the, the the line's a little jagged across here and i'm not sure exactly if that's just noise on the gps or what it is but it's it's not not much noise and comparing it to the one over here i guess maybe maybe this one over here looks the same it's just that i'm zoomed in farther on the other one so that's what i'm doing playing around with the gps stuff I, I now know how to get that data out and the reason i went down this path was because i put my led strip on the back that one i was talking about with the addressable leds and a, a arduino nano so i can put any arbitrary status on that i want and that's where I was noticing that for my GPS, I was only getting, a, it was either off or it was green. And I thought there should be some more states in there. So that's what took me down this path of looking to see how to get float and fix and single point and all, all this other stuff out of it. And that's that's how I got that far. And, and I also haven't mapped the colors on that um, LED strip. So right now, it just coincidentally, uh, this, if it puts out a state of, let's see, which plot was that? This one, wrong screen. On this one, so I either got a zero or a two coming out. Well, it turns out zero, the LED is off. And if it's if it's two, that just happened to be green, which is, I wanted green to show fix, but then I wanted to see the other the other ones in between. So so down here, if I, um, I could go through and take these and just say, take the bit position. And if it's if it's the bit position of 128 is set, then I can, I can substitute a color of green. And if the bit position of 64 is set, I can substitute, say, say yellow for that. And then come down, if it's single point, I can put in a red. And then if I don't have any signal from the GPS, I can then turn it off completely. So that way I'd have mul multiple indications from both GPS receivers to see, you know, just, just walking along behind it, I can see those in real time when they're turning on and off. And then the third LED I had connected to the uh, magnetic calibration status of the IMU. And I also didn't map the colors on that. So on the, the IMU itself, it goes uh, red means zero. Uh, I think a blue green is a one and then a blue is a two and then a, a three is a green. So that gave me the, the colors I wanted. And then once I just blatantly stick those numbers onto the LED strip, those number, th those colors don't match. So I could just go through and map those and say, you know, substitute the correct color so they match both on the little board and on my LED strip. So, so that was that was part of my journey of getting that LED strip to work. And now I can, you know, just take any arbitrary status I want and say if it's in this range, or if it happens to be this number, put them right on any any arbitrary LED I want. And that seems to work out. Seems to be working out quite well. That's really cool. That's I don't know if I had any. I don't know if I had any other any other things that I was doing here. Other than just thinking about stuff, and that's so any, the um, 
even when you get to um, less than RTK fix, you're still getting a stable GPS output, which I don't know, but it sure seems like they must be doing some averaging or filtering or something to try to keep that GPS position stable, even though you've dropped. It, it was it was good, except as I say, as I went around that corner, it that's still there. Yeah, it, it it jumped a little bit when it, when it switched from one mode to the other, but other than that, yeah, it seemed fairly stable going around there. And even over here, where it jumps, it drops all the way to a single point fix. Uh, that was, let's see, how can I? But your first tree, you're driving straight. It it lowers. I mean, you you lose RTK, but you still had a straight line there. I'm assuming you're still driving straight physically on the first tree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, basically, that that path you see there is the path I was driving on, but there's you know some jitter to it or whatever. So I, I went back. I did zoom out to hear, see this. Let's go. So if I drag this around. So even right here, I'm coming along. There's a fixed solution that goes to float. And I see I'm zoomed out too far. You can see the green one. You can see where it's at. I come along here. And unfortunately, that's I can't see what I want to see. So let's zoom out again. And then come on. So even when I come along here and see, I, I'm, in, I'm in a float and then it drops. Come along in a float and even when it drops a single point, it still didn't do any, anything stupid right in there. It, it went through that part where it's jumping in and out of float, between float and single point. So for whatever reason, it's doing a, a pretty decent job right there. That's not to say if I go out tomorrow and do something that looks exactly right, that it's not going to be all over the place. That's that's the other thing with this stuff. You know, from day to day, you don't know you don't know what's going to do. So I guess there was one other thing that I did. So the, the, the pink line here is the, that's what we're just looking at. That's the path I just driving on. And I noticed that when I went out and drove around with my wheel odometry, it was really bad. So right now this, this looks relatively rectangular before that was opened up into a really big, you know, it'd start here and come out like this and come over here and it would, it would, it would end up like over here somewhere the end was. So it's it a big, a big opened up almost a circle. And I, so what I did, I went back and watched the uh, Ross Agriculture videos when I was talking about my wheel odometry and doing it in Excel where I was changing the value. You can see it change, you know, ch the shape of that would change in real time. So from those videos, I took the numbers I had there, punched those into my code and recompiled and went out and drove around. And this is much better than it was. It's still not as close as it should be. But um, number one, this is better than I thought. And I was wondering if, if I drove around the block one way, you know, would it would it, would the would the thing look like would it look like this where here's here's the start and the end point are, are looking like that? And I thought, well, if I drove around the block the other way, is it going to, you know, basically this forms a spiral. If it's if it's not correct, it's either gonna spiral out or spiral in as you drive around. So I thought if I drove around, say clockwise, uh, well, this is this is the clockwise one here, it looks like that. I was thinking, well, if I drove counterclockwise. Is that spiral going to be much much tighter? Is it going to be much much bigger? And much to my surprise, the other one looks about the same. So it didn't really seem to, you know, the direction driving around didn't really seem to affect it that much. And the other the other thing that I, I was contemplating is that again in the back here, this this where it's see on the sides here that that's relatively straight, that's relatively straight, right. and this side is relatively straight. But on the back here, this is the alley where it's got this big curve to it, and that's where I explained before the alley. Uh, it's it's uh, tilted or it's it, it's the, the the driveway or the the concrete is made of two separate pieces that it comes down to the center. It's tapered down to the center, basically for water drainage. And the first time I did that, I drove I tried to drive right down the center with a wheel on each side of that, and that was basically then I couldn't keep it going straight, so my contact points were moving back and forth. So every time I've done it since, then I I drive enough to the to the right of the crack. So I'm always, the vehicle's always tilted left a few degrees as I drive down here. 
and I, I that's why I'm thinking I'm thinking that's why this is curved because I'm not on level ground at that point. But I can't really figure out why it's doing that. You know, just the fact the vehicle is tilted. Why I can't account phys in physics why it would do that. So I think the next time I go out and drive around, I'm going to purposely drive down the other side of the alley so it'll be tilted to the other the other direction this time and see what it does. Because I think what I I've got I've got two plots here. I've got one that's uh, here. Let's just let's see. So keep keep in mind what this plot looks like. See, it's got a curve. That's a uh, we'll call it a, a concave curve here, and then you can see um, these these lines are fairly straight. So let me back up to. Uh, I had a theory. What? My theory is as your center of gravity changes, your wheel slippage rate is going to change depending on which wheel has more or less weight on it. It, the, the center of gravity does change and I'm not sure my wheels are slipping, but just the fact that it's, you know, it's like if you're driving on a side hill with your tractor and you're, you know, driving on grass and your tractor wants to it wants it wants what's it do it i think the back end tries to creep down so you have to keep adjusting with the front to keep it going straight it's probably that same concept but i don't know if that's really what it's doing or not oh hey there we go that just automatically no it's, it's the same no this this is the other one so this is driving the other direction and again um the the, the rotation is off completely because i didn't try to correct for any of the rotation when i started but you can see this line is fairly straight. This line's fairly straight. Let's see. And this line's fairly straight. In the back, again, I got this concave curve. So regardless whether I drive around clockwise or counterclockwise, the, the endpoints are about the same amount apart, which I didn't expect that. And this is still in a concave curve whether I'm going, you know, driving to the right or driving to the left. So there's more, I, I've got more information I can see and more mysteries to solve now. And well, I've got this plot up. Let's see what we got here. Uh, well, let's see. I, I I loaded this right on top of its other data, so I don't I don't know if we got any valid data in here or not. I'm surprised this one came up. Let me just to just to verify. Let me let me make sure I've got the right one here. So let's go down here to odometry. And you can see all the stuff scrolling by. This is all the data. And it's all accessible directly in uh, plot jabber. I just go down and say, here's my my wheel odometry. I want the X and the Y. And you right click to make a scatter plot. And this one does not have to be swapped. So there, that's the curve. As I drove around in a counterclockwise, the curve looks like that. And just to verify that I have the other one here, I want to go to GPS Odom. That is that one. Yeah, GPS ODOM, so I come down here, grab that one, and the X and the Y, and right click and drag it over here, and put it down. So yeah, that's the same plot we were just looking at. I, I should have cleared out all the data before I loaded this. We, we're not confused about which ones we're looking at, but, but basically the odometry data looks the same whether I drive around clockwise or counterclockwise. And I, I guess that means, I'm, I'm pretty happy about that, I guess, because, that that means one less thing to have to have to deal with. Now I'd like to I'd like to figure out how to do this automatically. Do this do an automatic calibration, and there's something called the Borenstein square, and it's uh, a professor Borenstein from I think he's from CMU or one of those one of those big places, and he came up with this concept where you you take your robot, you put it in an open area, you drive around in a square maybe two or three times, and as I was saying before, as you drive around, this thing basically forms. It's, it's basically like a spiral. So it's going to spiral in or spiral out as you drive around. So if I see right now, it, it, the two endpoints are that far apart. If I drive around one complete time again, the endpoints will probably be this far apart. So it's so as I come around, it's going to make it. Uh, so the second time around, it's probably going to come out like this and go like that and come out like that. It probably end right about here. And if I do it the third time, it's going to get more exaggerated. It's going to end up up here. So somehow he had a way to analyze that and determine determine how to get the uh, you know put the proper numbers in to correct for that and I, so I need to go look at that sometime and figure it out so I can just tell it you know, drive around the square and automatically fix your numbers 
And in reality, I don't have to know over this long a distance. You know, typically you use your odometry just for just a, uh, you know, from you want to know from here to here what's it doing. You want to know what's my instantaneous heading and what's my instantaneous um, velocity and so forth. And typically you don't really need to know all the way around because once you drive into the grass, this all falls apart on you anyway. So, so th those are those are more things I've been playing with and. About the overall shift, what looks like a, I don't know, let's just say it's a 45 degree shift. That, that's simply because when I started, I didn't point, I didn't purposely point my, um, it, it depends on the start of one, because when you start the wheel odometry, it always assumes you're at zero, zero, X zero, Y zero, and a heading of zero. And wherever I start, it just locks those two together. And what I could do, in fact, let me pull that up again, share screen. Six screen. So there's an offset that you'd have to build in one way or the other. But see, so you notice right here when it started, if I get this back. So when I started, the, the GPS, um, it knows it started there because this point right here is my zero, zero. That's the latitude and longitude that I put in, just like you do for you pick a point in your yard. And I said, that's going to be my zero, zero point. So the GPS knows that. This is this is zero zero and it starts at I I decide that's like 20 meters north and like five meters uh, west or something of the spot. But when we start up the wheel odometry, it thinks it's at zero zero and it takes it literally as x x zero y zero and the heading of zero. Um, so so the rotation if if I would have started it on the correct order if I would put the vehicle ideally if I put the vehicle right on my zero zero spot here and line it up pointed north and then then start up the, the microcontroller code. So it says, okay, I'm gonna lock that on. Then this plot would have looked, well, actually it, it, the plot will look about the same, but it'll have, it'll have this offset there. So I, I, what I need to do is modify my odometry so I can say initialize to this, these values that I give you. So I can load in a current X and a current Y and a current heading. So if I take the values from take the values from here um, from my GPS. This is actually the, the GPS ODOM that, that Matt wrote. And so this is a, a, a position in meters. It's an offset in meters from your zero, zero point. So if I take that X, that X value and that Y value and the heading value and load in my ODOM, then it should lock the two directly together when I first start out without going through all this nonsense of, you know, I got to put it in this position and put it here when I start up. Basically, it just starts up and says, okay, what's the GPS is locked on? Take those values, write them into the wheel odometry, and that'll lock those two points together. And then the fact that this does drift over time like this, I thought that another thing you can do is you can keep a second set of values for odometry. So as you're driving along, say every time I get a good GPS reading, say a, a GPS fix that says I'm at this X, Y, theta location, immediately update this alternate odometry. So it's tracking exactly where you're at. So if my GPS drops out, then say I was coming around up here where, where I dropped out or whatever, which would have been around uh, right here. See, if this if this was tracking exactly with this, then I've got, you know, as I drive, it's slowly wandering off, but that's better than if I have no, no GPS at all. See, my GPS quits completely. And, and the point is when it gets to here, and it drops out, well, this point would have actually, this, this plot would have actually been tracking, say this one exactly. And then as soon as, it, as soon as the GPS drops out, the ODOM would continue. So the ODOM is gonna start wandering off one direction or the other, but it's gonna be fairly close at that point. So that's, that's another have, thing. That's another thing I can tab eight. What's that? You're still sharing tab eight. Uh, yes, I, I am, and I, I, I was using the wrong cursor. <laughs> I, I was using the cursor on their screen, so, but but yeah, say so my point was you're coming up here like this with GPS. If I have a second and an alternate odometry that's tracking exactly, I keep up, I keep forcing it to be at my current location. If I'm coming up here and the GPS drops out right here, and the GPS quits giving me anything, well the odometry is going to continue on, and as it does, it's it's going to as it come around, it's going to either wander off like this or wander off like that, depending how it's calibrated. But the point is. Uh, Instead of being way over here when it drops out, it's actually the, the odometry we tracking right on top of the GPS here. So that that may or may not be a good thing to do. And 
you know, how does that fit in with Ross? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. It could be if I feed both. If I could be if I feed my wheel odometry and my IMU and my GPS all into a robot localization, it will magically take care of all this. And that's something yet yet to try. So I'll have to see what that does. I think the notion of having a primary and a secondary and switching to the secondary when you drop RTK is a fantastic idea. <clears throat> And it could be, I just use the, the that what I call a secondary odometry, just use that all the time anyway. And the, the first one needs to be there for reference. So after I drive all the way around, um, so after I drive all the way around here and it says they're supposed to be the same point or not, but it, that gives, gives you yet another indication of what's going on. And if I get the, the odometry calculated better, they're gonna come out closer, but not close enough to be, to really still be usable over the long range. <clears throat> cool. And that's all I can think of at the moment, I guess, that I've been playing with. <clears throat> that's a lot. Well, now that I um, have burned a bunch of hours um, getting raw cereal to be usable again, I'll get back to uh, trying to get Ross data out of my IMU. Oh, last meeting I said, I thought I saw a driver that will let you talk to your board with a UART that it was an actual Ross driver. And it went digging, I know I can't find that. It turns out there's also something funny about that board you've got where you can put it in the uh, the UART dash, something like RVC, which actually says, says for like remote vacuum cleaner or something. And it just puts out a very simple thing. It puts out your, um, Maybe it's like a like something like an XYZ heading and XYZ pitch roll and yaw or something. And it it will run at 115.2 K BOD. And basically you turn it on and just keep spitting those messages out directly. Now you could look at those and see if those messages are good enough to use for what you want. And then it says otherwise, if you use the one called UART mode, that one apparently is fixed at three megabits, three megabod. Um, by default, and apparently it's, uh, I, I don't know if it's any harder to talk to because I think it said that the the same protocol or the same instructions are used whether you're using the UART or the I squared C. They're both, yeah, and last time you asked about what's that SHTP something you, you had, it was saying initialize and wait for that SH, SHTP protocol to be active or something. But well, it turns out that's what the, the company just calls their protocol. I found that in their, one of their sheets that said that, that I, I don't know what that stands for, but it's 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 basically what they've called their definition of the instructions they send back and forth between this. But it does look like the UART and the I squared C are supposedly using the same same protocol and the same functions or the same commands to talk to it, but it's running at three megabits per second. So you have to figure out how to deal with that. Now it could be if you put an FTDI adapter directly on the board. The FTDI is it if you can set it to three megabits per second, it will be happy with that. And then the interface between there and the uh, the computer, actually, if you use the actual FTDI one, I think it you have to specify a baud rate. I don't know if you can get the baud rate there up to three megabits per second or not. But if you're using the anything that's an ACM type port, that runs at 12 megabits per second, regardless of what you set the baud rate at. It just tells it the other end, it tells what to set the uh, the baud rate, say it on the, the UART end of it. So there, there's lots of little details there that possibly you could make this work, but I didn't go didn't go too far down the path. The number one, I don't have one of those boards yet, so I didn't I didn't look at it. But I told you last time I found a driver to do that, and apparently I did not find a driver to do that. I think I'm just going to uh, publish two simple data values one the human readable compass heading and one the rotational velocity um, i did try to look at the the one package i saw in the public domain um, their board was expecting an ftdi chip and because i'm using a nano 
clone, it's got the CH340 in it, so that failed immediately. I mean, it didn't even um, I didn't get past go on, on that. So anyway, I might be able to use sort of the coding structure and format, but what what didn't what didn't work? There's a company out there that's selling a prepackaged BNO80, and they have a. I'm just pulling it up. Um, oh, I I looked at that. I couldn't determine if they've got a, a microcontroller built on their board or if they just do have a UART to USB converter. And I couldn't find any word that told me that, so I didn't look at it too much harder than that. I I still don't know what's inside their package, but. Uh, the code is written to talk to an FT. I mean, they have a Windows version and they have a Linux version. And looking at it, what I could discern is um, because they're looking for an FTDI chip. You know, uh, even using Windows, it, it doesn't recognize, you know, it won't talk to, it won't find my board because it's like, hey, I'm looking for an FTDI connection here. And all I see is this CH340 thing. Well, I, I, I assume that's just being treated as a serial port. So whether you use a Windows or Linux, whatever it shows up as, it shouldn't care one way or the other, I don't think. You know, if it says on Windows, it says COM3, you know, whether it's a FTDI or a CH340, if it says COM3, I think you should be able to talk to it. So either, either there's something else going on there. Maybe, maybe when you're trying to specify it in the code, it was calling it the wrong port number or something, but I, I don't know. But the problem you're gonna have there, if it's not doing a direct UART into your chip, and they've got a microcontroller in between. If you don't know what the code is on their microcontroller for the commands, it's not going to do any good. If they if it has a microcontroller on the board and they give you code to load into that, then theoretically you could load your board with that. But if they've made up their own command set, it says give me a quaternion, and they send that across, and their board knows how to do that and sends back some whatever their proprietary message is then their code knows what to do with that. But if you don't have it in between there, that's not gonna, that's not gonna do any good, I don't think. Unless it really is talking directly to the UART directly into the chip, in which case then possibly you could you could make that work. Now the um here I'll pull up the code and show you what I'm talking about. And just by looking through their code a little bit, I couldn't tell, you know, somewhere it's gonna say, here's how we talk to the chip. They're gonna have a little function down there that says, send this to the chip, receive this from the chip. And it, you know, somewhere by looking through the steps, you can, you might be able to determine are they sending actual commands that the BNO80 understands, or are they sending, say, a, a message they've built up that, that their microcontroller has to understand. So you might be able to tell by looking at the code what what's going on there. But since I didn't have a chip to play with, you know, it, it makes digging through the code really hard because, you know, with all this undocumented code, it's, it's hard to tell what, what, they're, what they were thinking at the time. And you can't just say, talk to the chip and see what's coming out of it because I didn't have a chip. <clears throat> so these guys have two, um, They have a Linux, I think, if you go to their website, you can find um, uh, dun, dun, dun. They have a Windows driver and they have a Linux driver. This 
Windows um, program, you can't really see it, but um, when you fire up this Windows program and you plug in, well, I fire up this Windows program and plug in my Nano, obviously the USB serial or the USB system sees it. Um, but it doesn't immediately create a, a serial port. Um, so I don't know what is going on with their software specifically about how they're looking to see that FTDI chip. What I do know is, you know, the Windows version, you plug in a Nano, which is spitting out stuff. And it, you know, it, I don't get an error that the data is invalid. I get, I don't even see the board. Um, And it could be it says I don't see the board because they're expecting a certain response back. It could be it's talking. It just doesn't find what's what's expecting is why it's saying that. Yeah, well, I guess that's a point. Yeah, very well could be. Um, and it could it could be that. Uh, let me go to that page and pull up that uh, YouTube video so I can see it. It could be you know looking at that. How, how did you? Oh, there it is. It could be that looking at those messages would give you a clue as to what they're doing. I don't, I don't know if that's an actual message going back for it. Uh, let's see, that didn't work. On um, YouTube. And go to full screen. Come on. Come on. Why is computer share slow? But since they I just maybe watch it, they could be watching that video. Will tell you. Uh, he might explain what's going on there, and I can't, I can't read it well enough. I think if I let it go long, you know, sometimes YouTube will catch up and give you a sharper image, but I can't tell what that message actually says there in the beginning. But it might just be the values coming out, and I can't tell. Well, they've got things like it says. Uh, I think it says roll colon and then a number and, and pitch something. So it, it could be that message is either built by their software they're running there, or maybe they got a microtone that's building the message. But I'm sure that the chip itself does not put out a formatted message like that. So again, it's it's you, you really don't know until you track down, you know, what's what's inside of their box. Yeah, what's now that I think about it, they they, they do provide these two. Um, drive it certainly makes it look like that, that's got to be running on some sort of processor that's got a C compiler in it. Um, well, I'm, I'm guessing this. I'm guessing this is code that goes on your big computer. So it's just simply the you know that IMU serial that CPP probably is what what's it say right at the top there? Are they getting what what are their lack of comments tell you at the top? <clears throat> Can include I use that steady I use sensor. You're, you're creating a namespace for the sensor. Yeah, well, there so there's absolutely nothing there that tells you if that runs under Linux or runs under Arduino. So it's it, it doesn't really tell you anything here. That's the thing serial. But I'm guessing this is something like a ROS level or Linux level program, which still doesn't tell you what, what's at the other end. But just by digging through, you can get clues as to what's going on. And ideally, if you could find out what's inside of those, you might you might go to Google and search for whatever this thing's called. And it's always good to put the word hack on the end of it or or dissection or something. You might find somebody who's bought one of these and they open it up and say, oh, here's what's inside of this thing. And that that, that might give you a better clue is to, you know, it, to research this stuff. It, that's ways to dig in and find out 
uh, what, what, what's actually in these. Oh, okay. I was thinking this was, Um, that's been a little bit since I've looked at it. So if I look for so, so another clue here, if you back up one page, it's it's the other program is called something dot node, which or no, it's called it's called driver node. So I, I, that tells me that's that's a ROS program. In fact, see, it's including things at the top there. It's including things that are ROS messages. So this is all code that would run under Linux. This the serial serial CPP and this 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 node are programs will run under under ROS. Yes, but so that doesn't tell you what's at the other end of your serial cable. If you dig through here far enough, you'll say it says, says here it'll say here's a callback from whatever the device is, and then you can actually decode the message to see what, you know, what they're what they're expecting coming in. And at that point, you might be able to tell if it looks like it's a, a message directly out of your BNO85, or if it's a something they've formatted with a microcontroller to send to you. Yeah, I wasn't looking at it to read. I was looking at it to publish because this is a publisher. But it's only going to publish what they what they are expecting it to see. And if you're not providing that, it's not going to work. But there, um, so they've included that, which is what we were just looking at. If you go up one more level, instead of looking in source, do they have any other uh, any other directories? Include. Look under that include that top one that says chip I new driver. What's under that? Serial H. So that apparently is all of the code. So if you go back to the one that said something about node under source, that's got to be where all the the meat is. And look under yeah node, and then somewhere because um, it's going to say it says open serial port emu serial port, but somewhere there there's going to be data coming in from the from the serial port, and they're going to have to decode it somehow. Right, they're reading. Okay, so go go track down that read and parse and see what's. And again, be an object oriented code. This is going to be hard to find, but. This is the read and parse back in the include. Okay, in bytes to read, inside blah, 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 read. Definitely search new data at the end. So I think it's building up a uh, line of stuff. So if you go down to the bottom, it says parse. So parse is probably what's going to, uh, and there it is right below, it says IMU serial parse. So it's going to take a line of data that just came in. And if you can figure out from this, weight CS, weight data, weight header. And in fact, they're saying they're waiting for a header. Uh, you have to decide, does, does the BNO85 put out a header when it sends data? Or that, that sounds suspicious for like they've got a microcontroller that is creating a header that's going to send you. So anyway, it says wait for the header, wait for the data. Yeah, the BNO85 puts out a header. That's that, that's, you know, an 07 is a rotation vortex statement. So anyway, that, that's where you'd have to look right there to see if, 
this, it's here it's trying to decode whatever it just received. And we have to decide, did it receive data directly from the BNO80 chip or does it look like they've generated their own, their own data, their own format that they're running? So, and it could be if, if, if it is, I, I, I'd have to look at that really hard to see if that's just looking for a single character, a single character header. And then it says, says data and says weight data, uh, data field length. So it's going to receive an X number of bytes there as the data. And then what is CS? Is that checksum? Yeah. So, so go down a little further. It's going to probably verify the checksum and then state weight headers, weight header, process data, data field. So process data is probably what's going to do something with that. So I assume data field is what it just read in. Which is commented out, by the way. What is? No, up above. Let's go, go a few more lines up. Line 142 says process data. Oh, that one, okay. It says, it says if byte equals the field. So process data is going to take whatever data it just received. So if you search for process data and see what it's doing. That's where it turns it all into y'all roll pitch. So all that, all that forming on the right where it says static cast, int, static cast, blah, 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 data at one, data at two. That's, so you can say if, um, so what are you putting that into? Is that putting it into a quaternion? No, it's a, so, so the value of for ya, they're extracting from, they got a big long line of stuff here that, that has one, two, three, four, well, I guess the numbers are telling me 11, 12. So it's picking, it's receiving 12 bytes for some reason. And that 12 bytes might be, that looks suspiciously like, let's see, pitch roll, you know, acceleration. No, I, I was going to say, it looks like that UART mode that they, or the UART RVC mode or whatever they call it. But I think that's more, probably more data than what that puts out. So so that, that's the key right there. Something is putting that data out if you can figure out what your, um, if your BNO 85 will put out a line that looks like that of 12, 12 bytes. Oh. Uh, that, that, that does look suspicious like that, that you are RVC mode. It looks suspiciously like what? The, if you look at your BNO85, one of the modes is called UART-RVC or something, remote or something vacuum cleaner is what it stands for. And that's what they call the simplified mode. And it just puts out like two, two things that have three fields each. Just search for UART in there. Or, do you get the uh, index on the left? Maybe not. I don't know what this is. I haven't successfully opened this yet. Uh, I probably has to load it up the first time. Yeah, that's not what I wanted to come on. But just in that manual you just had, if you just do a, just do a search for UART. And it'll tell you the different modes there. Um, I didn't see any mention of that extra mode. So sequence number, animal, S format output packet. So that 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 other stuff you just had, you can compare it to what it's telling you here and see if these are, if this matches. Well, I think. Well, another clue is go back to that uh, 
do you saw that that code update we're just looking at and go to the where, where they're initializing the uart and they're setting a, a baud rate was that set to 115 too or was it set to three megabits or So, so somewhere it said that their UART RVC mode runs at 115.2 and their, their full UART mode, which does everything, runs at three megabits. And I, I, I assume it's the same, the same manual. Actually, I, I don't think I saw this manual that you're looking at here. So that's a different, different one than what I've seen. The other one was explaining, uh, maybe it was that, that SH2 manual that you had that was, and maybe I just didn't look hard enough to see all this, that they had actual formats and packets in here. I don't know. But that, that gives you some clues as to what you can look at here to, to see if you can make this work. But there was says SH, SHTP, that they, somewhere they said, that's the name of our definition of our protocol. So that's, that, that's where that name came from. Um, yeah, well, I'm sorry, it was an 05. So other things you could look at, at back in that, that Ross driver, there, there would be a configuration spot that says, we're going to tell the chip to do this. They're going to try to initialize the chip and you can see what they're sending out and see if it looks like it's the these SHTP configuration commands or if, again, if they set something that they're going to decode with a microcontroller. So probably under the node, it's going to have, um, I don't know if they have, let's see, what does it have? And, and, Ross knows, is there a main or is there, there, there was a main. This is function to go to a main, chip driver in it, advertise sensors, and down at the bottom they're saying set the baud rate, uh, open serial connection, main cycle. So it, so under open connection, it might be sending commands out. It could be they're just expecting the chip once it's configured to always put out the same data every time. I don't know if that's possible or not. And you wouldn't have to configure it in any particular way. So the answer is, I don't know if this will work directly connected <laughs> to a chip or not. Header. Set that header. And the other thing is uh, the for when they said you can you got a Windows program and a Linux program. Do those have source code for those, or do you just have source code for this uh, ROS driver? This uh, I've only seen source for the drive the ROS driver. That header, where does that header come from? Well, by well, by by C definition, that that is a constant. So header is a number defined in a header file somewhere. So they're saying if if the byte come that the byte we read does it equal this number, meaning it's a header. I didn't understand what you said. So header being apps. Being in capital letters means it's a constant by definition. I know, that, but where's the constant set? I'm not okay, it's, that, that's going to be in a header, probably be in a header file. So if you back out a level and in that include directory. Look, look in there and see if it's in there. Right, there it is. 
aha, does that does that match what you just had on that other definition? Or is that something? I thought that one you, you showed before we had an AA or something. Yeah. So in the, that manual you just had up. It doesn't match it at all. Well, that's, but but the, there's going to be like an overall communication header. Oh, right there, right there. Right there it says AAAA. -A -A -A. <laughs> Always equal to that. And this this particular scroll up to the top of this section. What's it called? H format, H -format output packet. That's what they're reading. So whatever an H H format output packet is, is another alternative output packet for the UART. So either either it automatically reads that, or somewhere in that node it said during opening opening connection or configuration or something it'll say set it to this H H format output packet. So you can go through this document. It'll say, here's how you configure. Here's how, here's, here's what you have to tell it to put it into this H format packet. And then that'll tell you what to look for in the ROS node as far as what they're putting out. So, so what you got there right there, is that data adequate for what you want? It's got roll pitch on, it's got the XYZ acceleration. Except the other one we were looking at, they were talking about magnetometers. So I don't know where they, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. I need rote Z axes to get um, steering rotation, you know, radians per second. I think I need Z axes rotation. Um, This is giving me acceleration. And I would have to probably do math to get that. So since this section was called H format output, I saw there's some other format output. See if, see if there's another one close by that has, there's an L format, what's it got? So, so it could be if you dig through these and you just output the right, you know, tell it to output the right packet and then, you know, look at their code to see how they decoded that. You should be able to merge those two together. I think. This thing's interesting, huh? It said it has special output. If you go back up, it said something. It said this UART is a little farther. Go up some more. Right there, it says UART interface. Certain products support UART interface with special output. Oh, so now you got a problem. Does your particular device have these formats? So that's that's another that's another issue. And they might that might be what the BNO85 is because they added on the stuff to make that that headset type stuff work. So it could be that's what these formats are for. They have you know special formats to give you what what they wanted to see for the game stuff. So it really just comes down to how much time you want to spend digging through this stuff and trying to figure that out. <clears throat> what benefit might I have by interfacing with it at this level versus um, just sticking with one of them? There's another one, H format. Yeah, that's the one they're using. This okay. Drupal A. So that seems to be it for those, um, what do they call them, host interfaces. And it looks like none of this matches that other thing I saw about the, uh, the UART-RVC mode, which a lot of people seem to be talking about. So I, I, again, I'm not sure. There, there seems to be a lot of documentation. I'm not sure what applies to which particular chip or anything else. <clears throat> I think it was on, I think it was either on the Adafruit or the Spark phone where they're talking about that other, that mode that I'm talking about. 
and it essentially was like one of these formats you're looking at here where it put out like pitch roll and yaw and then three other values. So it was one of the, one of the simplified formats, but they don't see, it doesn't seem to match what they're talking about here. So maybe that other one is for the BNO80 and this stuff you're looking at here is the BNO85, the stuff they've added on. I think. So I'm guessing, I'm guessing your chip has everything on it. So if it says it works for BNO80, it should work on yours. And if it says it works with BNO85, it should work on yours. I, th I think that's my guess at this point. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I'm going to go back to the Spark Fun code and rely on theirs for interfacing with it. I'm trying to and keep it. At this point, what I would like to see, if you can get any way to get the, the heading data out, and strap it on either your lawn tractor or on your car and go drive around, you know, just drive around a square in your car and then plot that out and see, you know, are you getting, and are, or if you get the whole calibration thing to work to you, say, so put it on your car and you calibrate it and then go drive around and see, or you could, you could drive around first without calibrating it and, you know, save that and then say, do the calibration, whatever it says, and then drive around again and save that and then compare the two to see if it's, see what it's giving you out. And if you have a way to, to view the calibration status and see if that's changing on you as you drive around, that would be that would also be handy. But it's always good. it's always good to get it working on the desk. But then as soon as you put it on a vehicle, you find it acts differently. So that's that's always handy to be able to do that. Well, thanks for hanging in there and going through that with me. It, um, just reminds me of how that work backwards when you get a piece of code like that. I was surprised how quickly you found this. If usually something object oriented, you can't find, you know, it'll say something like, it said something like serial dot something. You gotta realize you don't wanna search for serial dot because that that's totally made up. So you just gotta take that, like you did, you just took the, the, the piece off the end and search for it that, that did show up. And since there's only three files, Total, it was easy to find stuff too. Yeah, that's you're not dealing with a package with 50, <laughs> 50 programs, right? So anyway. I was just so I was going through that U blocks driver and it it has a whole bunch of files and it's all object oriented and it works for like nine different versions and from day one it works for any U blocks. Uh, thing so it always says oh if you got this firmware version or this firmware version yeah all the code is built like that and I can't find anything in there but I finally decided that you know that's where I figured out that it's going to put a zero or a two in so it's going to say fix or not is all I get out of the GPS fix and both both the uBlocks one does that and the NavSat driver does that so I had to go find this you know go somewhere else in the messages to find to tell me whether it's a fix or a float or a single or something else so it's just a, a lot of a lot of digging and a lot of aggravation trying to trying to find this stuff. Imagine how old their code is and how how they've added to it over the over the years. Different packages they've got to deal with. It's a lot of embedding. Okay, my man. I'm gonna run. Thank you for your time today. Okay. Have a great weekend. And we know Juan got home, so we don't we don't have to worry about him anymore. Well, he's uh, resting, I'm sure. Trying to you know, get cut back up, I guess. We'll talk to you later. Okay, bye.